Hello everybody, um, I'm very glad to be here to talk about gender today. My name is um, Rano Turaiva, uh, my awesome name, uh, I'm Rano Turaiva Höhne at uh, Ludwig Maximilian University. I'm habilitating there and writing my second book on uh, migration and Islam in Russia. Um, so I was doing uh, this research in the region since 2005. Um, when I started my PhD uh, with Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology. So I'm anthropologist working in the region since 2005. And um, the topic of gender was um, uh, really uh, was an interest in my research since 2005, since obviously uh, my female identity also uh, defines uh, my uh, access to the field that I spent much more time with women than men. So the issues uh, that were related to women was uh, always important in my research, in my work and in my uh, academic life as well. So today I will be talking about um, uh, decolonizing uh, gender studies in Central Asia and this will be uh, done in uh, two parts. So in the first part, um, I will talk to, I will generally introduce uh, the, the very contested concept, actually a very complicated concept of gender. Um, and I will try to kind of uh, refer this concept or contextualize more of this concept, uh, concept into the region. Um, and then I will highlight some, um, some very important events which are very much related to the topic, uh, namely uh, the Soviet past and what Soviets did uh, uh, in terms of empowering women in the region. So I would like to use this time on uh, talking about Soviet projects and institutions and namely uh, especially on Hujum uh, and Jin Savet. Uh, Hujum is, was the movement to unveil women that I will talk about and the institution which was also then further empowering uh, women in the region. The second part, in my second part of uh, my lecture I will deal uh, more uh, with marriage, institution of marriage and, and the concept of family in Central Asia, focusing on a very understudied um, uh, topic, namely Kelin, and uh, very much relevant uh, phenomena uh, today is polygamy and uh, the concept of oinash, or uh, I will focus more on um, the case studies on, 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 on Kelin and uh, Oinash. So, um, as I said, my, uh, particularly my research, which I did in Central Asia uh, since 2005, um, where I was uh, more focusing on gender, and then I, uh, during my research then on migration and migration uh, from Central Asia to Russia, I s uh, more focused on uh, female entrepreneurship. So, it was uh, going from uh, migration studies to uh, more economic anthropology. So I will try, uh, so in my lecture I will be kind of drawing on all these experiences uh, uh, which I had in the region and uh, my engagement with the region and my being uh, myself from the region. So um, why decolonizing? Why it's so important? It became actually uh, important um, after um, I started writing, uh, first writing uh, my material as anthropologist. So uh, I did my PhD uh, in 2005. I did my field work in 2005-2006 in Uzbekistan. And um, during the field work, as a native anthropologist and doing anthropology at home, I didn't, I didn't face any kind of difficulties in terms of language or in terms of access to the field because um, I was just accepted as uh, 
our own person, so I didn't have any problems with that or uh, with networking also. But the, the real problem started when I came back uh, home, uh, when I had to uh, reflect about my material and reflect about um, how I'm going to write and what I'm going to write. And especially in the time uh, of, uh, it was a Karimov's time uh, until 2016, uh, so I came uh, back from my first, f first field work in 2006, so I was really facing, of course, very different dilemmas. Uh, and in the process of uh, reading also others who did uh, the similar researches in the region, I was really, um, it made me really think more and more about uh, the questions of representation, the questions of how do we deal with the data that we collect, um, the, the questions of authorship and, and all these kind of uh, questions that were already raised by others, uh, for example, uh, more so I think in Africanist studies. So this kind of decolonial perspective kind of or approach came out as in the process of working with the material and doing the research in the region. And also um, becoming a scholar, a native anthropologist in the Western academia that kind of made all this uh, thinking rife uh, that, I that I started to apply a decolonial approach in my teaching, in my research and in my writings. That's why I think, in my opinion, that uh, decolonizing approaches are very important um, in any kind of research, not only uh, in gender studies, and particularly in gender studies, um, considering the sensitivity of the topic. Um, so why Soviet? We, we are uh, living in the times of very, very late Soviet, post-Soviet, and we are living in the age where um, generations have grown up uh, without any Soviet. So why would Soviet be so important? And we already also he um, he heard uh, a lot of critique about do we need um, this uh, post-Soviet, do we, do we still talk about post-Soviet and Soviet and what is post-Soviet anyway? Does it make sense? Um, in my opinion, Soviet and Soviet nostalgia, particularly, uh, was obviously Timur Dadabaev in his uh, recent research on his oral history, uh, which he did in Uzbekistan, showed also how much of the Soviet nostalgia, nostalgia is present in the region, in all kinds of uh, different topics. And in my own research also with women, uh, particularly talking about their situation uh, now and before and those uh, who lived during the Soviet times or who studied during the Soviet times or even who didn't know even about Soviet Union, they were still, this comparison were, comparisons were going back uh, to the Soviet past to compare something like which was better and now worse uh, comparisons, for example. Um, so that's why I think um, on the first hand this kind of presence, this very stark presence of this Soviet nostalgia is important to consider uh, seriously. If uh, women talk about Soviet times as something really that they see as good, uh, I'm myself a Soviet product, I must say. <laughs> um, so, and secondly, why Soviet uh, is important, I think if we look at, in, in our analysis, if we look at the institutions there, all these legacies which are present, uh, uh, all these institutions, all these language issues and other uh, kind of values and for example the value of education in, in this particular case for example. 
I think, in my opinion, or for this uh, analysis, I think it's very much important, particularly to focus on, on the Soviet projects of empowerment of women and their ideas about uh, equalities. So uh, I think that's why I decided um, to stop on this also in this, uh, in this lecture. So um, in this, uh, this lecture, I structured it so we first um, have to understand somehow or contextualize this very uh, complicated concept of gender. And then I try to localize it to go back uh, to it historically and genealogically. Um, so I will be dealing in my lecture with early and late Soviet of efforts to empower women. And then I will uh, highlight some um, institutional context of uh, gender in the region. Uh, so that to give uh, a little bit of uh, the overview um, of the concept. So, um, so starting with the gender. I think when we talk about gender, uh, we, uh, I think we have to start with Butler. And uh, if you look at all kinds of definitions of gender, it's, there is no one definition of gender, I guess. And I think uh, most scholars who are working in the gender studies are trying to avoid any definition. I think it's a very difficult question. So. Um, there is no one size fit for all definitions, so, but I will try to at least to engage with the definitions that are there, which are more or less popular or at least recognized. And it starts, I would start at least with the butler and her gender trouble. Uh, I mean, butler's uh, contribution to, to defining gender or understanding gender, I would more say, is uh, interesting because she's bringing this kind of very uh, performative uh, angle to definition of gender in order to kind of free it from this kind of very rigid uh, approaches of defining it as identity or uh, in, her, uh, in her work she's uh, saying it's a process. Nobody is born as a woman or a man uh, they become something um, as a result of uh, social interaction and living the life. Um, so I will try to show some definitions which are, which are there, which would or could make sense. And then I will try to contextualize, of course, uh, the gender referring uh, to its relevance in the region. And I will then also deal with the questions of uh, what kind of perspectives are were given and how it's important uh, for whom. So, I mean, decolonizing uh, gender, I think it will be very much important because um, you have very many different voices uh, and uh, politics of gender is also another big topic which I will not have time today to talk about. Um, so some definitions, as I promised, and I said that um, not uh, none of them, in my eyes at least, um, helpful. But at least it it's helpful in a way to which which really uh, helps you to think about these things. It it doesn't. I don't think that there is a final definition which could be applied readily uh, to any context. Um, particularly in, in, in Central Asia, but I think these definitions can at least um, um, uh, contribute to further thinking about the same things. Um, so I here, of course, I take the, the most prominent definitions which, which are interesting. Um, and we know that the gender is uh, uh, directly related to the issues of status, uh, gen uh, the identity, and the roles within the social relations and the social structure of the societies. And 
that's how you come to the definition of, uh, of this very complicated concept. And we have, of course, the feminist uh, strands of series, which uh, also have their own definitions. Um, I mean, the, the, the career of gender is not very old, but I mean, uh, this uh, we could maybe go back to 70s, where this uh, movement started. And then also uh, Butler's innovation, uh, bringing it to performative, uh, highlighting its performative character, um, wh who draws actually very largely on the works of uh, on the works of uh, Foucault, and um, I think uh, it's it's at least helpful to uh, take it to to get rid of these kind of rigid definitions and kind of uh, uh, binary uh, definitions, which are really. Uh, which are most of us, I think, um, we are always uh, caught up in. But I think it's helpful in this regard. Um, so um, to just contextualize uh, the the these kind of very uh, very uh, complicated concepts into the region, how it how can we uh, how can we uh, theorize the gender when analyzing the material from Central Asia? That's, that's more important, I think. Um, so contextualizing the, the, con uh, the concept. So before we uh, think about this uh, very difficult concept uh, and thinking about people who uh, um, analyze their own roles within their societies. I think uh, we have to think about what what changed there, what kind of social relations are there, uh, how they came about, and um, was this valuing education was always there. And I think these kind of very basic questions help us to um, understand how gender, or what kind of career had gender in the region. So if we look at um, the Soviet policies uh, back in the Soviet times, uh, I think we can imagine um, this kind of situation where, uh, where, where men had, uh, where women were sitting at home and uh, were first or second or third or fourth wives and um, took care of the um, children and uh, did uh, things at home. And they didn't much know about what education could offer or what would be. And I think um, this kind of very radical approach, in my eyes, I think, which Soviet took was really what I call, it really gave like this kind of gender turn because it was radically different. It was radically uh, what was not existing. This idea of un unveiling is, I mean, that's for a woman who sits at home and who is who knows only that women live this kind of life at home uh, under the whale and to and then the Soviet come, the Soviets come, and then they say that you have to leave the house and unveil and work and go to work, is really I think uh, was not imaginable for the women. I mean, I think um, it's very difficult to uh, to describe this very very radical move. I think in any words, I guess. Um, there are um, uh, very nice historical works have been written on the topic and all these policies, for example, Marianne Camp's works uh, on Hujum and um, others also did a lot of historical studies and um, very, really nice books are written about these things, but still it doesn't, um, it cannot really um, put everything in the, into the words because as I said, it was really a radical turn, and what I would call, uh, which was a uh, happening a gender turn in, in, in this kind of terms. 
So, um, so I would like to stop on, on Hujum uh, more because I think, as I said, one cannot explain it in books. We cannot, one cannot explain Hujum in, in a lecture. But I would like to, uh, to let you see some kind of uh, enacting um, scenes of, of the Hujum which are um, also, of course, uh, uh, played or documented. We can, of course, find a lot of uh, material in archives. Um, but I think seeing the scenes, I think, is uh, much more helpful to kind of at least imagine what it was. So, I mean, this uh, movie, uh, it, this is from Utkan uh, Künler movie, uh, which documents the hujum, actually. Um, this scene is uh, from the 8th of March, uh, where the uh, mass burning of the uh, Paranjis was performed. And this is the first woman who dared to, to open her Paranji. And I mean, if you look at the scene, uh, the other women uh, uh, it's not, you don't expect that after first woman uh, unveils that other women do the same. But then you see that the other women are also critical about um, that the other woman unveils in public. So, so you can imagine, so these women reacting to her unveiling is already says what, what this woman who unveiled in public will do when he she comes home yeah so you can already imagine all kinds of problems arising as like a chain reaction and then you have of course uh, religious authorities um, only this is Hamza uh, only some uh, young men who kind of joined or were interested in kind of making some kind of careers within the Soviet administration uh, who are active in this kind of field, who kind of share maybe uh, partly this kind of ideologies of uh, changing something in their societies. And uh, this uh, young uh, woman who is also, of course, uh, from the circle of, of these young people who organize themselves to do in, in this kind of movement of bringing change uh, uh, in these societies, um, they are very much, of course, active on the scene. They unveil, um, they perform the poems about these uh, religious authorities. She's actually reciting a poem about the religious authorities who are uh, depicted in her poem as uh, uh, women eaters or, or this kind of very kind of uh, very rough words about religious authorities. And she, uh, and the, the poem was written by uh, by this uh, Hamza, and she's uh, performing this poem. So, I mean, uh, that she not only unveils on in public, but also recites the poem itself is already something uh, really uh, daring and facing these uh, men directly in in public. I mean, also going through uh, through this uh, through men crowd, yeah. I mean, you can al you can already imagine how these women then walk in the normal streets. How shall they go uh, uh, through this angry uh, crowd? How do they have to go through already established cultural patterns that are practiced there for 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 years? And I mean, there are, of course, uh, uh, Russian administration, Russian women who are uh, dressed in European clothes. They, they of course, engaged a lot, uh, like teachers, teaching them, uh, uh, defended them. But I mean, uh, you can imagine in the context where you are minority. I mean, these young uh, men who are discussing with other uh, religious authorities, these are also minority. I mean, these were not the majority of all that that all young people went against the old uh, old people. 
but it was just minority who were doing their careers uh, to in, in close collaboration with the uh, uh, Soviet government. But also, um, these women who unveiled, they were also min minority. Because if you follow the history of unveiling, you see that the, those who were participating in these events of Hujum, which were not only this one uh, that is shown as in the film, but they were, uh, of course, they organized uh, very different kinds of uh, burning uh, parangi uh, events as events. Um, so the, these women who participated in the many events and unveiled, they came back home and rewailed. So, I mean, uh, we know that from the history that, that it was a very, very long process until uh, they reached uh, the full unveiling, or at least majority that you could watch in the street, uh, women, unveiled women uh, walking in the streets and uh, uh, having no trouble. Um, so it was a very, very long process, and it was not until um, I think early 50s that they uh, reached some kind of results. and. Um, of course, um, besides all these uh, unveiling events, there were also uh, all kinds of other um, activities going on parallelly, like education, uh, raising literacy rates, employment, engagement of, uh, at very different levels institutionally also, and also uh, creating public images through posters and, and, and um, other kinds of performances which were actually introduced very new in those times, like for example, theater, theater playing or uh, cinema watching, for example. And through this kind of uh, media channels, uh, of course, these images have been uh, transformed, um, uh, sent, uh, the ideological messages were sent through these uh, media channels and kind of this kind of image about uh, alternative kind of dressing, alternative kind of uh, uh, um, alternative kind of uh, leaving uh, was also introduced uh, through these other means. So I will here I will only highlight uh, the institutional part of it. Um, so which kind of institutions have been there to support women or to empower them or to change something in their lifestyle. So I will talk uh, more about um, um, yeah, the literacy rates. Um, I just wanted to show you some, uh, of course, some achievements, let's say. Um, I mean, uh, the numbers, of course, um, are really tremendous. If you look at um, from zero almost to 90% in several years, it's really like very aggressive change <laughs> also, um, I would say. So the literacy, literacy rates were really aggressively raised uh, very high. So this was, of course, done through the education of uh, all, uh, not only children, but also uh, adults, and in, uh, including women. And if you look at the uh, higher education levels, which raised uh, then later, also after 50s, dramatically, actually, also created this kind of um, uh, was the basis for this kind of uh, beginning of uh, valuing education, which really remained until now, which uh, sometimes um, it doesn't even match the reality, I would say, because if you, um, if you hear the discussions about uh, educating your children, like um, you would say, why would you educate the children if, you, if they will anyway have to do business? Business means like doing any kind of trade to survive. So uh, today you have uh, doctors or teachers as taxi working as taxi drivers, for example. So what does it mean today to uh, be educated, actually? So I will talk about it later, of course, but just to 
to give you an idea about how values uh, appear and establish themselves as values. Yeah? The value of education, for example, in this context, uh, where the literacy was zero, uh, where it was aggressively raised from zero to 90%, and then you have uh, in like uh, 30 or 40 years uh, the value for education uh, suddenly and then um, this kind of higher education which was al already uh, seen in the numbers of course and among women and these numbers are particularly for uh, for women is really um, amazing but I would like to stop more on the institution of Jean Savet which was created um, um, this is an abbreviation from uh, Zhensky Savet, uh, female uh, commit, um, which was uh, created uh, 60s uh, and earlier it was uh, Jean Odell, uh, which was then uh, stopped by Stalin saying we compl uh, the, the Jean Odell uh, completed its work because we now have all the women literate and they are all educated and working. So, uh, so the Soviet, if this is, there is a paradox about this institution because Jean Soviet was actually created originally to empower women, to help them uh, to somehow cope with the traditional settings where they were really constrained to not to go to higher educations where they were forced to marriages and. Um, this kind of in these kind of situations, you needed some kind of institutional help to uh, let some uh, to open more space for women and also encourage them to uh, to go out of their houses and encourage them to um, go for education and not for marriage and work. Uh, so these institutions played really tremendous role. Uh, within this process of uh, that women left houses, their houses and uh, went for education and um, started to value the education, yeah. So, um, and then this, uh, this Jeanne Adel, Jeanne Adel and now Jeanne Sauvet, they became really powerful institutions by now <laughs> that um, they were really, these are institution, institutionally the creations of Soviets, so they had this institutional base. And then through this kind of, through kind, this kind of state institutionalization of this support of women, they become really powerful. Not only that they were, uh, had their place within state administration, but also they had the access to women and access on uh, in, in the private sphere of, uh, of the lives of people uh, very largely. And what it became then is that, um, that they started to, s they already served, I mean they, when they were originally created they served the state to try to uh, get the women into work so that they worked in the industries created by Soviets. So they were kind of uh, left hand of the governments. But then after the Soviets left, then their function was um, again uh, kind of another hand of the government and also not to, I but not to empower women, but to control them. Um, in post-Soviet uh, period, if you look at uh, Jean Savet, I'm not sure. Um, I think there are some uh, works on Jean Savet, but if you look carefully on their post-Soviet period uh, functioning, and more so informal functioning, um, it's really interesting to observe that. Um, that they now use another kind of, they have now another kind of functioning. So they control women, they, they kind of uh, flow with the developments in the region, which I will talk 
uh, later more about is like uh, going back to to tradition to tradition if you want um, so this Jean Savet, for example, I will um, bring an example uh, from my own university experience with Jean Savet, where Jean Savet was uh, actually uh, making sure that the students behave. Uh, also um, taking sides with elder, elderly uh, committees or elderly members of societies where they belong to through informal networks. Um, or also um, doing other kinds of functions as well, like all these kind of women projects, which you would say that they would have like two legs, like one for uh, keeping a traditional leg, making sure that the, the women are behaving, and another leg uh, that um, everything goes uh, according to the existing politics. If we take Uzbekistan, for example, um, then you have this kind of uh, social policies which uh, uh, take care of the women projects. So you have this kind of uh, project, uh, different kind of state-supported projects. And if you take um, Turkmenistan, you have, of course, another uh, picture, then you have uh, the same uh, organization doing other kinds of things in Kyrgyzstan or Kazakhstan or Tajikistan, of course, uh, you have uh, very dif different means, but I think um, if, you l if you analyze the function or in the post-Soviet uh, period, it's, I think, interesting to see um, how these organ the same organizations changed. Um, so I would like to um, just to give some faces to, to, to my research, uh, from my research uh, field work, um, both men and women, of course, um, before I um, uh, continue on, uh, on the institution of family and marriage. Um, so I was traveling during my uh, PhD uh, research and uh, other research projects that I uh, did with uh, for, uh, on other topics. Uh, so I was in different, both rural and urban areas, but I, my research I uh, mainly did in urban uh, areas, uh, in cities. So I did uh, my PhD in uh, Tashkent. So, and my recent uh, research I did in Moscow with Central Asian migrants in uh, Russia. So I have, of course, met very different kind of women and different men. And I just wanted to give some uh, faces to, um, to what I, wa I was talking about. These are events. And uh, this is, for example, a, a childbirth event. Um, which is uh, for women. It was organized in the in the room of uh, of the woman with her child, and you see, of course, always that elderly women uh, take a more respectable positions within the event. Also in the space of events, of course, it's very also interesting to to see that young women are in the field of. Uh, serving, for example, the tea was also brought by young women, but then uh, put on the table by older women. Um, and then you have uh, brides or younger members of the families uh, serving the older members. So I will stop there the the first part, and and I think I will continue later with the second part. <laughs>